Hello, everyone, and welcome. Wow, everybody, I can't tell you how excited that video made me just seeing all of those images. Greenland is truly glorious. Uh, well, hello, hello, and welcome everyone to this live stream event by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I am Daniel Hentz, a science storyteller and your host for this afternoon, and I'm excited to have you along with us for this living science photo exhibit. You know, Ansel Adams once said, landscape photography is the supreme test of the photographer. And I would add that what makes this kind of photography challenging is actually getting to these environments and then understanding what's happening to create the landscapes that we're seeing. And in that spirit, today we're going to be taking a helicopter ride in photos, looking at the surreal majesty of Greenland's glacial landscapes and the science beneath these epic and diverse formations. If you're joining us now, we encourage you to comment your questions below. We hope to tackle your photographic or science-related curiosities toward the end of today's conversation. I'm joined today by Hui glaciologist Sarah Doss, who's worked at the institution for more than 18 years, studying paleoclimatology and the impacts of climate change. Sarah's done more than 20 expeditions to the polar ice sheets, 14 of which were to Greenland, where all the stunning photography you'll see today is from. We're also joined by Roger Fishman, who's worked as a professional photographer for more than a decade. During that time, he's been able to circumnavigate Greenland in a helicopter three times, bringing back some of the most mind-blowing portraits of the glaciers there. Today, everything you're going to see, hear, and even feel is from an environment that we all have a direct impact on. It is my hope that by the end of this live stream, you'll walk away knowing a little bit more about the science of glaciers and have a greater appreciation for their beauty. Let's start with the artist behind the photos you just saw. Uh, Roger, tell us a bit about the imagery. How did you first get involved in shooting Greenland's glaciers and why from a helicopter? Why not do this all by drone? Well, sure. First of all, Dan, thank you for having me. And Sarah, it's a privilege to be doing this with you. So uh, it's gonna be a great time, hopefully fun for all the people watching. You know, I was doing a lot of aerial photography in Iceland and I said to my pilot one day, hey, can we just fly over the Denmark Sea and fly around Greenland? And he's like, I guess so. So uh, that's what we did. We literally flew four and a half hours from Iceland to Greenland over the Denmark Sea and then circumnavigated uh, this amazing country. And so what I do is I, I tend to photograph it straight down and when I do that, I do that so we eliminate familiarity, familiar, uh, any context. It also en enables people to feel the art and feel Greenland, but also to use their own imagination. Uh, additionally, I do a lot of landscape work. So this way we have both the ability to zoom in to the specifics and also zoom out and see something that is familiar. Uh, the reason I do my work with the helicopter is frankly, you can go more places. You know, you have to be able to travel this amazingly large, massive country and drones just can't go there. Now, I take photographs and I do travel with my drones, which is what some of the footage was you just saw. Uh, so you, you need both to be able to deliver uh, the experience back to the viewers, back to people, so they can really feel Greenland on different dimensions in a very multimedia uh, fashion. Excellent. And uh, I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit here. Uh, some of the photos you'll see today are also from Sarah Doss. Uh, and I'd like to start with the first image here and uh, just kind of start from sort of the macro level of these photos. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about this image and sort of your work in Greenland uh, and some, you know, I know you've done some photography work yourself. What's going on here? Great. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just preface by, by thanking um, uh, Huey and Roger for this opportunity to collaborate um, and to welcome everyone who's joining us today. Um, I'm excited to share some of my photographs and also to be able to have a conversation with Roger about some of the science behind um, the stunning work that he's done. Um, as a polar scientist, educator, and explorer, um, the Greenland ice sheet is very near and dear to my heart, but I know for many of you, Greenland is a very distant, foreign, perhaps unimaginable or even scary place um, that you hear about in the news because of ice loss, crevasses, and global warming. Um, so I'm really hoping through this event that um, both by sharing the science and the art of Greenland glaciers, um, we really can leave you with a sense of some of the awe and wanting to know more about the science and glaciers 
and perhaps even some motivation to think about the impact that all of us make in our daily lives on these fragile environments. So this um, picture that we're starting with um, is one that I took a few years ago from a helicopter um, during one of our expeditions. And we thought it would be a fitting picture to start with because it really shows, if you can see those tiny specks in the center of the scene, that's a science team that I was leading. And it really shows um, what I like to think of as kind of science at the top of the world or on the edge of the world. And here we are, um, we're pulling behind some science instruments on the, the surface of a, of a thick glacier where we're trying to um, make measurements to understand how thick the ice is below us, how the layering, the structure is. And in this particular instance, we were um, navigating, trying to figure out a place where we could drill an ice core. We could extract a long, uh, thick cylinder of ice in order to reconstruct past climates um, that are locked up and sort of held in, in secret in this ice cap. But I also love this picture just because I, I think it really speaks to part of, of what motivates me as a scientist. And it's not just answering the technical and complex questions, but it's really the sense of, of wonder and awe of, of traveling to new places. Many of the places we go were the first people to ever set foot on that um, speck of land, which in a, a, a world of so many billions is really incredible to think of places still being unstepped on and untouched. And if I could just add, Sarah, what yeah. I, I love about scientists is at the core, there's not only tremendous curiosity, but at the core, of it's really being an explorer because you're going someplace that hasn't been traveled to before, doing something that frankly is quite risky in many regards. And I think that a lot of people times think of scientists as being like in a lab uh, and doing sort of analysis. But truthfully, you're at the frontier of what's going on around the world. And to me, that's a, that's a great balance of both the outward part of it and also the understanding of what's happening with it. Exactly. And, uh, and I think that some of the best science, especially when you're talking about earth or environmental or ocean science, which is where, you know, who is really um, leading in so many areas really comes from this sense of exploration and wonder, um, really driving people forward. We spend many hours also in our lab coats, but I think what, what sends many of us <laughs> Uh, gets us to to get up in the morning or to to leave uh, you know leave the beach in the summer and end up on an icy landscape like in this photo is really that curiosity driven uh, passion. Um, so here's another photo that uh, is taken from one of my expeditions and and you'll see that it's quite distinct from the one we were just looking at. Um, there's also some small people for scale and uh, just for the sake of folks like my mom who I know is watching. Hi mom. Um, there are uh, appearing that we're on the edge of a precipice here, but we're also we're also quite safely back from the edge. We're in, we're in no <laughs> danger. <laughs> so here here we are. We're in a part of the Greenland ice sheet that we call the ablation zone. And in, in contrast to where where we were in the prior picture, which was uh, snow covered and very thick and um, and layered, here we're in a part of the ice that's melting dramatically every summer, melting more and more, especially as the Arctic warms as the planet warms. And what happens as the ice starts to melt each summer when the sun emerges from the, the long Arctic winter is uh, the water collects in, in small streams and pools. And then these, these little rivulets form together into larger rivers and lakes. And they start to carve these incredible dramatic features across the landscape. And here we're very interested in understanding this water flow. Where does it form? Where does it go? And, and how does that ultimately impact the glacier movement, which is how the ice will get from the center of Greenland into the ocean, where in turn it really can impact things like sea level rise. So this is an image that I took in Northwest Greenland. And so everyone knows for the last three Julys, July 2018, 19 and 20, I flew with my pilot, a wonderful pilot named Matthias Voigt and circumnavigated Greenland. And in this case, we hit tremendous winds. We we're hitting about 30 to 40 knot winds and trying to get this image. And as you can all tell, it, it creates a lot of different senses and feelings. And one of the things that created in my mind right away was, what is this? Why did this happen? How did this happen? And that's where I, it transitions from art, contemporary art, fine art, but it transitions into what's going on scientifically from a glacial perspective. So Sarah, maybe you could help me and the audience know what are we looking at and, and how did this happen? Absolutely, and, and Roger, I mean, this picture is stunning in so many ways, the, the different layers, the colors of the blue, the patterns that you see uh, on, the, on the water 
Um, you know, when I first saw it, I actually was puzzled myself as to what we were looking at because there almost seemed to be like a, you know, a, a snakeskin feature on top of the water. And I said, well, that doesn't quite look like wind driven. And, and in, in talking about it together, what we discovered is that this was a, a river and probably um, a drainage system that had frozen over. So this, uh, in the prior photo, you, you may recall, you had uh, small figures walking along a deep canyon where a river was, was sort of roaring through. And where that water goes in many cases is into a moulin, um, which is what's shown in, in Roger's picture. Um, if we can go back to that one. So that those rivers will end very abruptly in these deep, deep holes called moulons, which is where this water reaches all the way through to the base of the glacier. In some cases, uh, this can be over a half a mile or, or a kilometer or so, sometimes even in deeper, um, plunging down to the bottom of the ice. Uh, but these features are also very ephemeral. And so here, what, what we're seeing is these uh, meltwater features. Um, at some point, they stop delivering this water and, and they may freeze up on the surface. What's, what's also nicely expressed here is the different scales. Um, you know, I think it's nice when you have the, the people in the photos, but it's also nice to step away from that and see, you know, you can see tiny little pockets of, of pools of water, but you also see this massive feature sort of overwhelming the scene, which is really wonderful. So this image was taken uh, between Uparinavik and Kanak, which is Northwest Greenland. And, you know, what attracted me to it obviously was this exceptional, the colors, designs, there's a fragility to it. There's also this sort of harmony and balance, which I'm always looking to sort of capture and create. Because just so everyone knows, I think of myself more as a designer and a composer or a, a portrait artist of Mother Earth, but Mother Earth being the, the true artist here. But what I also loved is that you can see the water moving down into a moulin. So it has a lot of different uh, dimensions going on. And I was hoping, you know, Sarah, you could explain more about both the moulin, the ice structure and the colors and how that all happens. Absolutely. So what we're what we've done here, if you imagine yourself in in one of Roger's helicopters, is we've gone from being on the ground to, to zooming up a little bit higher in that last photo. And now we're even higher up. So we're looking down at a large scale feature from from quite high. And so you imagine these these water systems forming over the course of the summer and, and you can see here in the, the top part of the picture this large pool. Uh, so so what we call a superglacial lake that forms and there are thousands of these that cover the, the um, ice in Greenland each summer. It's just an amazing sight to behold. But um, these lakes will grow in size and, and sometimes they will drain catastrophically or sometimes slowly. And that happens when the edge of these lakes, uh, sometimes happens when the edge of these lakes reach uh, cracks or crevasses. And um, one of the things that's interesting to me about this photo is that once you've seen these lakes through various of their, what I, what I consider life stages, is you can kind of piece together the history of what might've happened here. So you may see there's, there's um, patterned ground. So there's, there's the smooth white surface on the edges and then in the center, uh, outside of the blue area is what looks like sort of some, um, you know, crumbled bits of ice. And then you have the center where you still have liquid water. And what's interesting to note, if you sort of peel back that understanding is, is that the patterned ground reaches just about to the edge of that, that ravine where that intersects the crack that's, that's running um, sideways across the photo. And that suggests that this lake grew to some size where it intersected this crevasse system and started to carve and plunge its way down through to the base of the glacier, but it probably also had some sort of ice layer on top of it, the, the lake itself. So you have now this multi-layer, you have the, the ice sheet, the glacier, and you have a pool of meltwater. And then on top of that pool of meltwater, you have a thinner uh, uh, skim of ice, perhaps from the prior winter or from a very cold spell. And so when that lake rapidly drains, uh, which can happen in hours or days, that ice that was previously floating on it is left behind. And so you have that kind of remnant of that behavior uh, reflecting the, la the last maximum size of that lake. So there's so many things at play here, but it is, if you sort of step back from all those details, it, it just leaves you with this amazing um, sense of, of, of the scale and the fragility of, of all these features. And Sarah, just to add to that, you know, from a height perspective, we talked about it, uh, most images, not all, you know, the low end, they might go to 500 feet, 300 feet, but this one was probably between 1,500 and 3,000 feet above ice surface. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's just to give context for everyone about where I was and how we shot this straight out of the helicopter. 
Roger, I, I have a question for you. So how, when you get, get to those heights, which are quite high above the surface, do you, you sort of spiral up or go straight up? How does that feel to be uh, hanging out, <laughs> shooting during that time? Well, you know, you get into that flow, it's like a zone and you're so focused on what you're seeing and what you're feeling that it becomes using, you know, altitude, right, as, as another way to help design and compose a photo. So uh, it always just feels, one, I feel a lot of gratitude, but real excitement, and I'm really lost in the moment. In fact, last mm -hmm. summer at one point, we went up to 8,600 feet just so I could get a whole melt in frame. Uh, that was a little intimidating because it was like 1.30 in the morning. Uh, but it's, it's uh, genuinely, it's just exciting, and it's it's so exquisite, and you're so connected spiritually that uh, that's what keeps bringing me back more and more every year. That's wonderful. So I think uh, before we go to the next picture, oh, oh we're going to the next picture. Um, <laughs> we're going to go back down to earth. <laughs> go ahead. So now, uh, now we're back on the ground. We've uh, descended from our thousand, many thousand feet height and set down on the ground and come out of the helicopter again. Uh, so now we're now we're looking at a, a photo from a, another field season of mine where um, again now you have some scientists for scale explorers uh, you can also call us and now we're we're down on the edges of one of these crack systems and you can see the water starting to rush in from the edges um, and in fact this the photo was taken remarkably we were camped on the edge of one of these large pools of water large lakes that um, that had just recently drained and in some instances, these lakes actually split open in their center rather than just pouring out over the edge. And so here we were exploring this uh, newly formed lake basin. So where we're walking around had been under 30 or so feet of water uh, just a day or so before. And we were able to map out this crack system that um, really split through the center. And it, to me, uh, was a really dramatic moment. We had been studying these lakes and we had been looking at them uh, using satellite imagery and putting out instruments over the, the summer when we weren't there and, and sort of digging through the data, to understand these processes, but to actually be there on the ground and be able to experience it uh, and to, to look at it firsthand was, um, was really dramatic for us. So Sarah, question, when you're this close to a crevasse and even after it's drained, how do you test for the safety of the ice, how solid it is, are there any areas that are gonna break up? What are, what are you looking for? Sure, so you it's hard to see in a photo like this, but um, but you you can you can really tell in general where the ice is um, is starting to get crevassed and unstable. Uh, you have patterns of crevasses forming, sometimes multiple lines of them. Um, in this particular instance, it's kind of interesting because, and this will get a little bit a uh, little bit wonky for some, but but these lake basins are actually um, in a closed depression. So if you think of like a bowl, so it's actually an unusual place for a, a crack to form or for a crevasse to open. So normally, what happens is a glacier is moving over the landscape, where it's very thick and flat. It's very smooth on the surface. There are no crevasses. Um, when it starts flowing very quickly or or moves over a rough bottom, especially if there's say a mountain range underneath you get um, this pulling apart of the ice at the surface, and that's what forms these cracks, these openings. And so um, you have maybe the ice bowing up and starting to pull apart, um, pull apart at the top. But in fact, where the lakes are, the ice, is, the ice surface is in what we call compression. So the ice is actually being squeezed together. Uh, so it takes something like a, a very big lake drainage to open a crack. So it's not inherently a region that should be crevassed or that is still undergoing um, crevasse crevassing or opening. So once so the lake is drained, it's really just a remnant feature. So Sarah, should I tell my pilot it's okay for him and I to walk in those areas next time we go to Greenland? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, this is this was taken in actually near the National Park of Greenland, which is the largest national park on planet Earth. It's quite remarkable and you know, a permitting process is really required and we do scientific work uh, with a range of different scientists uh, wherever we go uh, and in this case again i was struck by the, the patterns the design and the notion how the water was moving on one side and the other yet there was like a, an ice island in the middle and then it started to cut through in a specific way so i'm, re I'm really curious sarah how why does it melt the way it melts and then how does it come together and, and form that sort of deep trench into the ice sheet 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I would say for the most part, it's probably similar to, to landscapes that we might see on, you know, the rest of, uh, of Earth. So if you have a very flat area, um, you're going to have water moving more slowly and perhaps sort of spreading out and coming back together. So you can imagine a braided river system right. or something like that. But if you start, and I can't tell from this photograph directly, but if you start to get to a place where perhaps the um, there's enough water that it can start carving a canyon and it'll, it'll smooth itself out. So as the, as you get more and more melt, uh, it'll start to, to carve a deeper and straighter channel, or perhaps the ice there is, uh, the surface is a little more sloped. So it, it sort of has more energy because it's, it's got more sort of gravity pulling it down. There's, there's a couple, um, things that could be at play here. And we saw and a lot of this. Go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, it's, I mean, it is such a beautiful picture also. And, it, and I love this one really reminds me, I mean, you could be in, in many places in the world with a, a photo like this. Um, it's just the greens and the blues and, you know, sort of a winter landscape. Well, yeah, that's what I was gonna reference, which is the more that I travel, the more that even in Namibia where people say, oh, there's no water, but what you're seeing is the, the uh, absence of water, but the impact of water, you see mm -hmm. patterns that are, are familiar and similar and that really show you how the planet, we're all connected, both scientifically, geologically, uh, and from history. So uh, I do find those patterns quite reassuring in a way that no matter where we go, there we are. That's a great word for it, absolutely. So this picture here, we're looking at um, one of our, our expeditions in West Greenland. And uh, we've been looking in the last few photos at, at many of these large river and, and lake systems full of this brilliant blue water. Um, this that I this I thought was really nice for for sort of illustrating the ephemeral nature of many of those features, and perhaps this is where it is in contrast with uh, many of the places where you might expect a large river to be. You don't expect it to be gone there the next day, but actually there are many places now where rivers are drying up and disappearing. Uh, in this particular instance, it wasn't so much a case of of the river drying up or not having a source of water, um, but. Um, more that perhaps the water that was filling this canyon uh, had found another source, another crack or move on to reach the base of the glacier, or it could be sort of a remnant channel. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked too much about today is the fact that, you know, the surface of the ice, while it seems uh, perhaps not from the crevasses, but as a whole, it seems quite stable, it's always moving. So this, this ice in Greenland is always moving from the center of the island where it's over, um, you know, many miles thick out towards the coast. And so you have rivers and lakes that are being carved in the surface, but then those features are being transported downstream towards the ocean. So perhaps this canyon had been connected to a big lake system, but that was years ago. And so it's just sort of left on its own to, to erode and weather away. It's, it's funny you mentioned about the, the movement because you know you see, and I'm sure you've seen it, you know, different glacier types coming together and forcing new structures and new designs. And obviously there's energy being transferred and sounds being made. And sometimes when I get out of the helicopter and sometimes my pilot will fly away because it's not safe for the helicopter. But for some reason, he, he tells me it's safe for me. I have not figured the logic there, but I, I trust him. I trust him so far. He must have already. <laughs> but, you know, I'll stand there and then you'll hear the ice making noise just by the nature of change, the temperature, the melting water. And regardless, you're always thinking, what's really happening underneath my feet? And then I'm thinking, I don't really want to know. I just want to fly my drone, get the footage, and get back into the helicopter. Yeah, those pops and cracks and things like that really do remind you that you're you're standing on something that is that is a moving and and it does feel alive. Actually, yes. You no, know, look, this image was actually taken uh, outside of Kangerlussuaq, which one of my or all of them are my favorite areas, I have to be honest with you. I don't have one favorite part of Greenland because it's all my favorite. But there's a lot of energy there and a lot of the, this cryokinite material, uh, which you know, I'm sure, Sarah, you can talk about. But I, I just love this notion how the, the aqua was going through the dark and surrounded by the white. And it felt like to me a lot of times the anatomy of, of our bodies, like there's a heart and there's veins and there's pulsating of blood flow and it comes to life and it, it brings you in, and it centers you. So I always find these connections back to our own lives, our own bodies, and also to nature overall. But I was hoping you could share more of what's happening here and how does the blue end up dominating the green and what is the, I mean, the black and, and what is the black exactly? Yeah, and I love that this this picture speaks to you as kind of like a, you know, a, 
a living creature, a living being, because actually that's very connected to the different shades we're seeing here. So I, I think many people think of glaciers or, or Arctic landscapes being, you know, starkly white or white and white and blue. And here it's really clear that the, the colors and the patterns that we see in Greenland are, are much more varied than that. And that comes about from a number of reasons. What, what's, what we see expressed here and what is prevalent in a lot of these areas near King Lusak, Roger, where this picture is from, is that there is a tremendous amount of dust um, so that material from, you know, whether it's volcanoes, forest fires, or just atmospheric dust that gets deposited on the ice, uh, not just today or, you know, from things happening this year, but, but the ice that's emerging on the surface is, you know, ice that's hundreds, thousands of years old. And so it's also melting out and leaving behind um, dust and, and debris from, from many, many thousands of years ago. And that darkening surface provides uh, in turn um, pools of water which accelerate the melting. So a darker surface will absorb more light and you'll get these, mm -hmm. these pools growing. And you can see that in the small speckled darks around. Um, and then sometimes they'll combine into larger areas and, and you can actually create fairly large habitats. And so what, what people have been discovering is that um, these dark and, and environments with lots of water in the summer when you add sunlight are, are perfect sort of refugia for life. And there is microbial life all over uh, Greenland ice sheet. It's been discovered on the ice, in the ice, under the ice, emerging from the ice. It turns out that Greenland is very much alive. Um, everywhere you look, uh, you can see life. And, and so you have the nutrients um, that are available from, from these dark uh, materials. You have uh, the microbes themselves creating sort of darker, darker mats uh, material. And then you have that accelerating the melting by um, allowing the sunlight to melt even more water so it really builds on itself. Yeah, for me, everywhere I go, you just see more energy and more life. And this photo was taken way up on the ice sheet, you know, probably about an hour and a half, two hours away outside of, I, I believe, Alulasat. And so, you know, we constantly, we just wander. Just so everyone knows, you know, we don't know what we're going to see. We always have to wander and wandering requires us to fly and to fly to different altitudes so we can look out to the horizon and sort of say, okay, what's over there? And truthfully, a lot of times we don't know. Something has to catch my eye, catch my heart. And then I'll go, okay, let's go that way. And then you sort of in my own way, as I explore, discover like this beautiful symmetry, these colors, these lines, and then this beautiful sort of ice sheet on top of the ice sheet surrounded by water. So um, I was wondering, Sarah, in this case, we have you know, lines coming out from the water. We have ice in the middle of the water. We have these different colors. And we have obviously the, the dark material, the cryokinetic material. What exactly are we looking at? And, and, and why and how does this even happen? Yeah, this is a stunning picture. I love, Roger, how you've really captured by getting the horizon there. You really you know, sort of get the scale of things, I think. Um, and. We, we talked a little bit about this process a few pictures back where you had that crumbly ice texture of approaching the crack. And so there's just so many different time scales here. And, and so you see these small rivulets of water forming that summer that are carving through the snow and ice, filling this lake. But then you have this ice surface in the center of the lake, which um, there are thousands of lakes. Many of them freeze over in the winter if they haven't drained. And then as the summer, next summer ramps up, it starts to melt at the edges first and melts its way in. And so you may have a little bit of leftover winter ice in the center. And so you, you have kind of glacier ice and then glacier melt and then this newly formed uh, ice sitting on top, but it really provides for a very stunning um, stunning scene. And, and to your one of your points there, like, so as we're flying, we typically will fly higher and higher in 3,000, 4,000 feet. So we can have a sense of like, where, where are these melts? Because that's really what I'm looking for on the, on the Northwest side. And last summer, there were hundreds, not to say there weren't hundreds before, but we saw more than we'd ever seen. And the more altitude we have and the more distance we cover, obviously the more that we see, and we see them all the way up now, actually about mm. as far north as you can go in Greenland. Yeah, you're starting to see melting really accelerate all around Greenland. Yeah. Um, and when you when you have that melting more and more, you're going to start to lose that that winter snowpack and expose more areas to this seasonal melt and these kinds of features. So now we've we've kind of gone off uh, started. Our very first picture was kind of in the center of the ice up high and dry. 
uh, looking for layering and coring. And we've, we've gone through the melt zone and now we're approaching the coast. So uh, most of Greenland's glaciers exit into these uh, deep wide fjords where the glaciers pour off the land into the ocean. Um, and so as you know, scientists were interested in studying the glacier in all these different environments. Um, and this picture I think is, is a, a neat one to um, uh, sort of start to wrap up on because it, it brings you all the way down. It gives you that vertical expression. So you see the front, this calving face of the glacier. I have a helicopter sort of uh, for scale, but also um, to you know, remind you that, that we're out there uh, taking measurements. In this case, we use the helicopter actually to deploy oceanographic moorings right at the front of this glacier. Um, these glaciers uh, kind of fall apart when they when they enter the ocean. Um, you may think of the uh, polar oceans as being cold, and if you were to go in for a swim, it would be quite cold. But but as far as the glacier is concerned, when it when it hits the ocean, it's like being in a warm bath and starts starts to melt much faster. So the front of these glaciers are a very dynamic, but also very tricky and dangerous area to work. Um, you wouldn't want to go yourself right up to the front in a boat to say make some measurements or or put out some instruments. So we use a variety of tools, whether it's a helicopter, uh, we started using some autonomous vehicles, uh, boats to, to make those measurements um, and, uh, and also things like that. And then you can see in the center of this picture, kind of a cave-like feature. And that's really illustrating the ways that this meltwater that we were looking at previously exits uh, the glacier. And, and in this case, there's a, an aerial expression of it, but often it's underneath the glacier underwater. And so you, you can't see it with your eye, but you can pick it out when you're looking at the water structure. So as I mentioned earlier, and I know Sarah, you and I have discussed, you know, when you travel and wander around Greenland, you, you see things that the trigger, you know, our own framework of familiarity. And this one really reminded me of the, of the rings of a tree of telling you about its life, its age, its story. So to me, I felt like I was looking into history, into both its growth and also, frankly, its decline, but ultimately, I felt like I was looking at a story of the ice sheet and of planet Earth over thousands and thousands of years. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about it, but also about the symmetry of it. I always wondered how exactly does Mother Nature create such beauty, but also beauty that has so much symmetry, so much harmony, and that looks like you said, the inside of a, a gorgeous redwood tree. Yeah, I love the analogy here to, to a tree and, and for some others it may also remind them of, of looking at tree rings or tree layers and, and that's a good one to start with because what we're really looking here is an, is an exposure. So after we sort of melted or carved back the surface of the ice, um, here's a place where, where what's expressed in, in the photo is the layers, the natural layers of ice. And you could almost imagine sort of counting or picking out layers and you'd be looking at different intervals of time and you see darker bands and lighter bands expressing, you know, times where you had uh, maybe dustier uh, conditions or, or just reflecting different periods of climate history. Um, and they're, they're expressed here if you imagine, um, you know, the surface of the ice as we've been talking about this whole time is very dynamic and undergoing a lot of change. It's being stretched and pulled, it's melting, it has snowfall. Um, and um, so what we're seeing here are these layers being expressed on the surface, uh, such as you might see uh, if you were in the Grand Canyon, where you can look down through geologic time through those layers that are expressed there as they've been carved out. Um, and this gives us a glimpse into the interior structure of the ice, which normally is really hidden from view um, in, in all the other pictures, really, we, you know, as a scientist, we're out there, we know that we're standing on top of thousands or tens of thousands of years of ice below us, uh, but you, you really don't see it. You have to just, you know, sort of know it or, or measure it and you can, you can do calculations. But, but in a photo like this, um, it, it really comes to light this layered structure and that all this time is, is expressed. But the fact that we can see it here also suggests that something is changing, um, that a lot of this uh, ice that used to be buried and protected is, is sort of starting to melt away and, and become more exposed. And it's, at some point, we'll probably not be here anymore. So for me, this is one of the most sort of poignant images, because I feel like it's a story that, that says so much about all the issues that we all know about and that we all think about and, and are trying to change. This was taken off the Northwest coast coming down from Kanak to Parnavik all the way down. And it struck me as the solitary iceberg a receding glacier. It was a very stormy, turbulent day 
to be honest, did not feel good to be in a helicopter that day with a door off and it was also raining. So it had all the recipes of feeling what the image looks like and what is really happening. So Sarah, I was hoping you could also talk about what we are seeing and, and why we are seeing this as well. Yeah, and this this photo really struck me. I, I mean, every time I see it, I I get almost choked up. I you know, it, it, to me, I I just feel viscerally, you know, this little finger, this tongue of ice that's sticking down is 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 so diminished. And if you look around in the landscape around it, you can imagine this large, wide valley, this big floodplain in front. That this glacier used to be massive. It used to be overwhelming. It used to fill that whole valley. It used to you know connect back to a much larger uh, body of ice, and it's now almost. You know, sort of retreating within itself, you know, sort of a protective nature. It's come up out of the warm ocean. It's it's sort of going back, you know, back to, to what's left of the larger ice sheet. And it really speaks to um to the dramatic changes that are happening around Greenland. And and I think what's also very poignant about it is that we've been looking at so many beautiful pictures of blues and whites and and ice and snow and and really a, a landscape without ice and without Greenland without these glaciers is you know, while beautiful, it's, you know, it's these sort of browns and greens and it's, it's different, you know, and it, it's something that I don't, I think we want, we want both. I agree well, completely. I'm going to jump in here just to say thank you so much. Uh, both of these images are stunning. There you have it, folks, everything all together on the same page, a few images that we might be able to get to as well. Uh, we, we have quite a number of questions for the two of you, and I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the science behind these images is absolutely stunning. And I, I agree with Sarah. I don't know if I could live in a world without uh, this kind of uh, turquoise and blue and all these shades. Um, so I'll, I'll try to give each of you a question, but uh, Sarah, I'd like to start with you. Um, one question from somebody is uh, about thawing and, and melt water. So I'm gonna kind of, there's a few questions here I'll kind of put together in one. Uh, Prima, are there any, uh, even in these photos when you first saw them, were there things that kind of resonated with the sort of uh, maybe came to you as sort of a premature thawing or, or kind of uh, <coughs> explain what you were seeing in your research? Um, I think one of the things that that is compelling about, you know, Roger's photos is, is you know, I, I've been working on the ice, but if you're going up to a, a you know, glacier and doing a field campaign, you know, you're really focused on one specific area. You get to know that area very well. And one of the things I found looking at his photos and in talking with him, he's, you know, having circumnavigated Greenland, he's, he's just seen so much more than I've ever seen, is both the familiarity. So in many of these, I said, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. I know how to explain that. And then in quite a few, I said, well, that's interesting. I, I don't really know what's going on there. You know, this is not a pattern that I've seen or behavior that I've seen or, or doesn't necessarily make sense to me. So it both speaks to the, you know, consistency of some of these features and behaviors, but also that there's still mysteries out there. Yeah. And Roger, um, I understand, uh, and I'd like to tell people too, that uh, you and Sarah have a little bit of a collaborative effort going on. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, a, a little bit about that, uh, if you don't mind. No, sure. Look, you know, it's important for me to, to share my, not just my art, but my access to Greenland when I'm traveling. So Sarah and I are going to collaborate on a, a little scientific research project uh, and hopefully be picking up samples along the way in support of the work that she and her colleagues are doing. So it's really, I guess it's really important to share with and work and collaborate with the scientists, with educators and schools and children, and really try to get as much as we can out about what's happening in Greenland both a beauty perspective, but a scientific perspective. So people feel connected to our planet because the truth is what we do wherever we live impacts Greenland and what happens in Greenland impacts us. So there is a, a symmetry here. And I think that's why it's important for, in this case, Sarah and I to collaborate and can share as much as we can. And sort of a follow-up, uh, Roger, sort of a part B to that question is, um, you know, how many do you hope to, how long do you see yourself doing this specifically with Greenland? Uh, <laughs> I hope I can do this literally for the rest of my life. I am madly, completely, deeply in love with Greenland. The, the people are phenomenal. The land is spectacular. And the experience constantly touches my heart and brings me tremendous joy and love. So I hope to be doing it not only this year and next year, but for as many years to come as possible. Uh, and I'm just going to end with one more question for Sarah um, regarding the science. You know, you've been working on uh, studying various aspects of the Greenland glacier system for a long time now. And I, I'm curious, uh, some people are asking, 
um, how have you seen uh, melting change over time? And I remember it reminded me a little bit of out of our, co our conversation offline uh, that it's a little bit about inputs and, and outputs. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that is, you know, scientifically interesting about Greenland is that it's always been a dynamic place. So you've always had snow coming in, especially in the winter, you've always had melting in the summer and icebergs calving and the ice flow. So all of those things are natural processes and they're expected. Um, but what's really changed just in the time that I've been traveling to Greenland in the last few decades is that these things are out of balance. So what used to happen is that the snow coming in would be balanced by the melting and the iceberg calving. And so while you may have large numbers on each side, the overall balance, if you think of say your checking account, if the money coming in matches the money coming out, it doesn't matter how big those numbers are. And the numbers in Greenland are big, but what's been happening is that the snowfall stayed fairly constant, but the melting and the calving has accelerated dramatically, really just in the last couple of decades in response to global warming and the Arctic amplification of this warming. And we see that when we travel, we see the ice margin retreated from where it was before. We see, um, you know, I can go from one year to the next flying from a small town up into my study sites and see a new piece of land that's popped up because the ice has thinned there that's never been exposed before. Um, as Roger said, when you fly way up high or way inland, you'll see, you know, these lakes perhaps in areas where you never observe them elsewhere. Um, so very dramatic, very dramatic changes just, just in my career. So uh, we are at time. Uh, it's unfortunately all the time we have for today. I'd like to again thank Sarah Doss and Roger Fisherman for joining us today and uh, for sharing their inspiring insights about Greenland's glaciers. If you haven't already, please be sure to follow uh, Sarah and Roger on social media. We're gonna have their tags up now, there they are, uh, to keep up with their amazing work. Uh, and if you're looking for your next Ocean Science Live event, you can also register for Hui's next Ocean Encounters, Diving Deep with our Submersible Alvin, which is on Wednesday, April 28th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, this is Danny Hentz signing off.